Uh, so we really, uh, I'm just calling it Truth or Consequences Part 5 because I don't want to leave uh, the spirit of being in Revelation in terms of what God shows us, but like I said, we're just going to call this Our Father. And uh, to read from John MacArthur's commentary to begin, if you want to know all about God, listen to Jesus. Why? Obviously, he's God in the flesh. He's known him forever. Jesus taught us the major truths about God, his love, his holiness, his justice, his power, his omniscience, his providence. But there is one lesson that supersedes every other lesson he ever gave. There is one title for God that is repeated in the Gospels 181 times, 124 of them in the Gospel of John. And that title for God is Father. More than anything else, more than any other concept of God, more than any other theme about God, Jesus majored on the fact that he was Father. Father was always Jesus' special way of referring to God. He said, my Father, our Father, your Father, and just plain Father, or Abba, Father. So as we look to the specific teachings, specifically in John chapter 5 today, we get a better understanding of God as our Father, what it means to be earthly fathers, and I should have added this line too, what it means to be earthly children of our heavenly father. So when we think of as what, what Jesus reveals about God to say, well, I'm not divine, I don't live a perfect life, let's not forget the principles of Jesus' relationship to God because he has lavished his love on us that we might be called the children of God. What a wonderful heavenly father. So we're going to read John 5. The context here and is the... Uh, Man healed at the pool of Bethesda, and as always happened to Jesus on the Sabbath, which always um, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, just uh, hated Jesus doing that because uh, he wasn't supposed to be doing that, even though healing was a wonderful thing. So after he had healed this man, we read, picking up in verse 16 of chapter 5, For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. It's a very similar line to what he says later when I and the Father are one. They knew what he was saying. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath but also said that God was his Father making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son, shows him all things that he himself does. He will show him greater th works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Charlie said as we got up and talked to one another what you're going to do on Father's Day. You know, I got my little card here and I think I'm going to go to Chick-fil-A. <clears throat> Somebody said I'd get a free lunch today. And uh, Now, what if I told you, well, I really know one of the owners and they're going to open up Chick-fil-A just for me and I'm going to have my Father's Day lunch there. Um, would, that, would, that, uh, would that anger you a little bit? Nah, some people don't, I don't care, I'm going to do my own cookout. But I, I, I just wanted to get just a slight touch of what Jesus was dealing with. In fact, I did a sermon a long time ago called Besides Still Waters. This man there at the pool of Bethesda waiting for the stirring of the water so that he might be healed. Jesus steps in and, and heals him. And again, to do something on the Sabbath, to work on the Sabbath, was against the law. And Jesus coming against the law, though he fulfilled the law, that the, the Pharisees were just, well, they wanted to kill him. I don't think anybody would want to kill me to go do it in Chick-fil-A. They probably want to go with me. But the point being that the, what was more important to them? And so Jesus responding to their lack of having the proper priorities. And we find ourselves dealing with that all the time. Should help us, as he's speaking to them, getting our priorities straight. Specifically for fathers, earthly fathers, but also for all of us. Because we are, and if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, children of God. One author puts it this way, in Christianity, God is often referred to as father because of his interest in human affairs, similar to a father's interest in his children. Christians, we believe God is our father because he is our creator, redeemer. The word father implies a father-child relationship. And Christians believe that God's fatherhood is eternal. We just sang about it. 
Through Jesus Christ, God is the Father of all Christians who are called the children of God, I just mentioned that, and are heirs with God. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. I bow my knees before the Father, Paul says, from whom all fatherhood, every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. There's a play on words here which renders the translation a little difficult, but it's easy enough to grasp in principle. Human fatherhood derives its name from capital F, Father, in heaven. It's not the name such as it is at issue. Rather, the claim is that we know what true fatherhood is from our Father in heaven. Human fatherhood is an imperfect rendering of that divine reality. Now, don't let that mess us up. Some had some great fathers. Some had fathers that aren't so great. But our heavenly Father is perfect, powerful, protective, loving, guiding, and always there for us. Amen. Shown in his relationship to Jesus. And so as we, as we see that and we see his love, then we have to understand that, well, God of all creation invites us, the mere work of his hands, to call him Father. We're invited to draw near through the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us. When we believe in Christ as Savior and Lord, we are, Lord, we are born again in his spirit. So we honor him that, day, th that way this day. Well, let's talk about what Jesus says in these verses. First, and I'm going to jump down first to, uh, to verse 20. I'm going to get a little bit out of order because I feel it's, it's so encompassing of God himself because he is love. And that first is this holy relationship. For the Father loves the Son, shows him all things that he himself does. He will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. As God has shown Jesus, you know, and to think that Jesus didn't say a word, Jesus didn't have any activity, any thought, unless it was from God the Father. That will often come to my mind as I think, you know, and always believing that Jesus is perfect, that everything he did was perfect, but when I start thinking that the very words of his mouth, every single word was perfect, it should overwhelm us. But the source was God the Father himself. This holy relationship, this love that he showed was based on love by giving. Look at John 3, 35 and 36. The Father loves the Son, given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. As Jesus then is saying here, well, this is my relationship to God Almighty, God the Father, whom he refers to as Father. Already the Jews are out to kill him for just disobeying the law. Now to say he has this relationship or to say that he is God, of course, eventually did drive them to kill him at the cross. Do we see in this relationship how much of a giving God our Father truly is? James tells us that every good and perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights. Everything that we have, when we talk about even, well, you know, I, I earned this, I, I got at this job, and I pay for this. Well, who gave you the job? Who gave you the ability? Who gave you the opportunity? God himself. That's this holy relationship. And in Christ, fully to live that out as the Father on this earth, what did Jesus do? He came to give life. He came to teach. He came to give the words of God himself that everything that he taught. This is the, God loves the Son, shows him all, the, him, that, all things that he himself does. Now it's on into John, and we've been studying John in our Monday night Bible study with the young men, and it, it's just constantly, as we just talked about, how many times, God is Father, God is Father. Why? Because Jesus, through John, John is showing us the divine nature of Jesus himself. We can't wrap our minds around it. We have to believe it by faith that he is fully God and fully man. With the Father equal, but also Father, Son, Holy Spirit as the Trinity. And so as we turn to what I is often referred to as the real Lord's Prayer, that's John 17. This is Jesus' prayer in the garden as Jesus prays for himself, his immediate disciples, and, and prays for us through the whole chapter. He says at the very beginning, he spoke these words, lifted up his eyes, this is John 17, 1, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son may also may glorify you. So this holy relationship is love by giving, but it's also love by glorying. Let me read on. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Now look, 
John 17, 3. You want to memorize something other than John 3, 16? Here it is. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Another good one to memorize. When it's time for you and I to pass from this earth, oh, that we might be able to say, I have glorified the Father on this earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. As Jesus gave his life at Calvary, they didn't take it from him. It was God's perfect timing in the fullness of time as he came to this earth. In the fullness of time, he gave his life to leave this earth that we might have eternal life. And in that obedience, we just need to take this to heart. It's showing love by showing glory. Verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. As the introduction said, that there's no one that knows the Father better than the Son, because they are one. This holy relationship, this love by giving, this love by giving glory. And the word glory, doxazo, it means to render esteem and, and to um, properly ascribe weight by recognizing the real substance or value. We're going to talk about it a little later on. Very similar to the word honor. What are the things that we value? And the question comes then, do we value this relationship? Do we value the fact that God has given us his son? He's given us the opportunity to love him in return. And that love, we will share, hear this, we will share the Lord's glory. He's adopted us into his family. And as we are going to heaven one day, that we share in what God has given to Jesus Christ. We're part of his family. How is that relationship between you and me and the heavenly father, our Heavenly Father. That's, I believe, the first challenge that comes out of John chapter 5. Any basketball fans here would know that this past week, Jerry West, Hall of Famer, died at the age of 86. High scoring Hall of Famer, who's now this is the interesting part because they talked about um, the legalities of, of did he get rights to, if you see the NBA, NBA logo, apparently that's a silhouette of Jerry West. Did you know that? And they used whatever he did at driving the basketball at one time as a silhouette. And they were, I saw an interview on YouTube this week, and they said, what do you feel about that? He goes, well, I don't know if there's any uh, value in that because I don't get paid for how many times that logo is shown. He was 86 when he died. He left his mark on the NBA as a player, coach, team executive after entering the league in 1960, known for his great jump shot. He was consistently one of the top scorers in the league every season that he played. And now they chose his silhouette to represent the entire league. When we come to grips with what it means to be a Christian, what it means to have faith in Almighty God, Jesus, only Jesus, the, the Son of God, the man God in the flesh, our faith in him is what makes us a follower and make, gives us that relationship with God. He has done it. And so when we look at his life and we look at here, turning back to John chapter 5, of just what he's then told the religious leaders who were out to kill him, saying that, well, this is my relationship to the Father. And in that, challenging them, because obviously they were all about the legalism, they were all about just doing things their way, the challenge comes to us as well. Are we relating to the Father in a way that gives honor and glory to him? In a way that has the same kind of giving love that it gives to us? Secondly is, I'm calling it handling responsibility. As we look back a verse, most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Now, if you realize that the first words that we have of Jesus in the Scripture, when he was 12 years old and he was in the temple, if you remember, it's one of my favorite stories because they're there for the feast. Joseph and Mary went on three days down the road and realized that Jesus wasn't with them. I, I just love that story because I'm thinking you've been given responsibility for the Son of God. Oh, I thought you had him. Oh, no, I thought you had him. 
And just as you laugh, I think, boy, the Bible is so real to know that there's real people. This guy at the Pool of Bethesda, real suffering. Jesus brought, brought real healing and real love to us. And so they went back to the temple. He was there teaching. Verse 46, we'll pick it up in Luke chapter 2. So it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. All who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. His mother said, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. It, very interesting. Obviously, father is little f, because Joseph wasn't his real father. And what did he say to them? Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? At that age, he knew that the very will for his life to do whatever the father told him to do. Again, we are not divine, but as followers of Christ, can we say the purpose of our life is to do the Father's business? Folks, that's a challenge. Fathers, what is your business over your family? Provision, to lead and guide them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, to protect them, to show them the love of God right in their own family. And then, mothers and uh, Men, women, as God's children, do we honor and glorify him and know that while he has us on this earth, there's business to be done. Are we listening? When we speak, are the things that we speak only what God tells us to speak? Whew, wow. I can honestly say, yeah, somebody's shaking their head. Oh, no. In fact, I uh, had an associate pastor for a while and went on back into the business world, and we come to staff meeting, we were often accused of dragging our feet but we'd start the staff meeting with this question have you heard from God on this decision and if we hadn't we didn't do it aren't we about the father's business so there are many good ideas was it God in that there are many things that we felt like maybe we need to say was God in that how different would our lives how different would the things that we do be if that question came to all of us have you heard from God on this have you heard from God to say this? Have you heard from God to talk to this person or to do this thing? Well, Jesus, living the perfect life, was always about the Father's business. God, from Jesus' perspective, is the one with his Son who loves his Son, blesses his Son, empowers his Son, honors his Son. That's the second sub-point here about the responsibility of Jesus, and that is the Father's blessing. Look at Psalm 103.13. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for a man, his days are like grass. Chris said this earlier. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. How many of you feel like time is just, just moving quickly along, right? I want to see my mother raise her hand because she'll be 92 here in a couple months and she tells me, oh, it just gets faster as you get older. I'm like, Mom, it can't get any faster. It can't. For the wind passes over, it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But, but, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. On those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. In other words, those who are about the Father's business. Oh, that if someone called us on the phone looking for us, what are you doing? I'm about the Father's business. I don't remember the last time I've said that phrase, and we need to say it more. That as Jesus, with this divine responsibility, as his followers, now listen, we have been given a divine responsibility. We studied in a community group the other night, just the Great Commission. The Great Commission isn't just for his disciples, and as we see in John 17, he prays for them, and then he prays for us. And all through that prayer, in fact, I hadn't planned to say this, I'm going to flip back to it because it's just so good, and if you had not read it in a while, you need to read it. He prays for all believers. Verse 23, I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one. That word means complete. That the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. 
Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that there may be, they may behold your glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father. Here he is again. Father, Father, Father. The world has not known you, but I have known you, with, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Is the love of God in us, Christ in us? Scripture says the hope of glory that then comes a responsibility of sharing that good news, loving those who don't know about the love of the Father, and understanding that his business is about changing lives and advancing his kingdom on this earth. And is that what we're doing? Well, go from basketball to football. As many of you know, we have a new... Uh, Running back for the Ravens, his name is Derrick Henry. You might have heard of him at one time. Six foot three, I think they said he's 247 pounds, but I think he's, uh, is he 30 years old? Way over the hill for some people. But I love this headline because it says, uh, they're ready to give him a chance, they're ready to give him a full workload. Why? A lot of tread is left on that tire. I guess that remains to be seen, but for wherever we are in life, Obviously, if God hasn't taken us home, there's enough tread on that tire. We just had to get new tires for the car. There wasn't enough tread on the tire, and the mechanic said, you better get new tires. Some of us maybe need some renewal in our lives, but it comes down to the responsibility that God gives us what we need. He gives us the opportunities that only he can fulfill, and it's only through his strength and guidance anyway. So as Jesus is talking to his enemies, those that are ready to kill him, he's talking about that he is going to do only what he sees the Father doing, obviously challenging them, obviously challenging us, and made them even more angry because, again, being equal with the Father. How well are we handling that responsibility of being God's children? That's what he's called us to be. The third point is, as we get on into, the, and there's a lot more to say in, in John chapter 5, but we're going to just end here in verse 23. Verse 22, back to the responsibility, the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. We'll talk about that more as we get toward the end of Revelation, that that's what Jesus' role will be. But look at verse 23, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. When the folks will talk about God, Scripture says the devils believe and tremble. But when we talk about Jesus, the only Son of God, God in the flesh, the, the, the one who has shown his love perfectly to us, the one that gave his life that our sins might be forgiven by his shed blood, the one that has ascended to heaven, preparing a place for us, and he'll come again for us. It's the one we're honoring and regarding because that's exactly what he's saying the Father does. That word honor, tamao in the Greek, it's another word like to give glory. It means to value. It means to honor and reverence, assign value as it reflects the personal esteem attached to it by the beholder. Do we honor our Lord and Savior Jesus? Do we give him the value that's more valuable than anything on this earth? Well, if we do, our time reflects it, our money reflects it, our words reflect it, our attitudes reflect it, not it, him. We're re honoring and regarding him. And the flip side of that is to not acknowledge Jesus is to then bring on the wrath of God. It's very clear here. 1 John 2, it's even more clear. This specific acknowledgement is what he's talking about. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is, who? Antichrist. Had to get a little bit of revelation in here for us, you know, to keep us in the game here. Who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And again, just thinking of the verses right past this in 1 John, and I'm giving all these verses to memorize. We've been talking about memorizing Scripture, that we know that um, 
that we are of God, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. This is the end of 1 John, and reading from John chapter 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. He who believes in the Son of God has witness in himself. He who does not believe in God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given his Son. Now here's what I want you to hear really here. This is 1 John 5, beginning in verse 11. And this is the testimony of God. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Heavenly Father. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Now verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. When someone says, how can you know? You give the testimony, you show his love, you speak for his glory, and someone says, how can you know? It's 1 John 5, 13. I have written to you these things, you believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know it? Do you know that Almighty God is your heavenly Father? It's personal because he loves us and we're to reflect that love. He gives us a responsibility as a father would give responsibility. And in that return that we're to honor and regard him with a specific acknowledgement, you sent your only son. He is my Savior and Lord. I'm adopted into your family. I now will live for you, share your glory, expect you to come again. And the second part of this honor and regard is this, I'm calling it spiritual alignment. Galatians 4, 6. Because you are sons, and again, children, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. It's a personal term for being able to say, some commentators have literally called it Daddy. This is a personal cry of back to point number one. We have this loving relationship with the good, good Father. Boy, I'm glad we sang that today. Love so undeniable I can hardly speak. Peace so unexplainable I can hardly think. As you call me deeper still, as you call me deeper still, in love, 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 you're a good, good Father. It's who you are. And we also then sang after that, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am. Is that our identity today? I'm sorry I didn't bring the picture because um, I just have such a great, I, I'm so blessed by my family, but there's a, a school called the Bullis School up in New York, and so my wife decided for a good family picture, let's just get sweatshirts from that school, and let's all wear them, and we'll have a picture together. So we have the Bullis on the front, we all have T-shirts, it kind of looks like, well, don't you guys know your own name? The school actually called and said, hey, can you get the picture for us? I think we've run out of, of sweatshirts. Like, okay, let's do that. We're aligned. This is who we are. This is our family name. This is what, and, and this is what God has done for us. I, I don't, I'm not embarrassed to say that. And I love my children because as we, they were raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord, that as they grow into adults and as they trust the Lord, and now as they're leading their families to trust God. That's just what we read earlier about the blessing unto our children's children. And I, I, know it's, I know you believe that. That's the desire of our hearts for our families, for our family as pastor of Crossroads Church, that our family of God would be so aligned with God that we would act when he says to act, we would speak when he says to speak, and all that we do would give him glory. Wow. I think that's why I like flying the drone. I love the, the view from the heights. And I would, I would say, all the men running around, all the different activities, when we ate together and sat in fellowship together, I really believe God was glorified. The activities were fun. We shared the love of God with one another and shared a meal together. Sometimes it's the simplest things to say, I'm going to specifically acknowledge that God is good. All the time and all the time, God is good. 
Do we have that regard for Almighty God? You might have not seen it at a wedding lately, but in Britain, the trend that's been around for, they say here in the article, for the last 15 years is to have an owl fly down the aisle and bring the rings with it. Wedding rings arrive by owl. It's from Stoke-on-Trent, England. Juliet has been to many weddings. She's a pro while the happy couple are exchanging vows. She comes out of a dark box, hops into the gloved arm of Duncan Blake, her handler, with a 270-degree turn of her head. She takes in her surroundings, suddenly jolts into her emotion. Whoosh! Off she flies down the aisle. Two rings and a little pouch tied around her skinny ankles. Gasps come from the humans sitting below her, stretched wings. Seconds later, she lands on another outstretched arm, often belonging to the best man, other times to a bride or groom and delivers the ring and then gets a reward of a raw chicken's foot. I don't know where that comes from. And then she leaves the room as quickly as she entered it. By now you realize that Juliet was an owl, one of several around Britain who had been trained to take a starring role in wedding ceremonies. Again, it's been around for 15 years. Harry Potter kind of set the train. They're quite a, uh, the trend. They're quite a mainstay for weddings. Social media plays a role saying, are you, you know, are you uh, millennials just love a trend? And this, uh, this one, gonna, for many couples, whether they're into wizardry or not, the owl's presence is mostly about giving guests, guests a special experience. That was the case for this one couple here who said, I do, and they had this new experience. We're not particularly Harry Potter fans, the couple said, but they've been looking for a special surprise for their guests and stumbled on the owl as an option during an online Search. So it's a no-brainer. Let's, let's have this activity. Now, I said that to say, well, I, I, I've not had that happen. I've seen doves fly away from ceremonies. I've seen other ways of seeing the rings come down the aisle. But when I read that about, we want to give a, a special experience, and, and I looked at that as almost, okay, we, we, uh, almost a distraction. Because as I counsel with couples that I marry, and well, I learned this from my earthly father long ago. It was the first wedding I was ever in, and I'm looking in the mirror and print myself, and he walks by and says, Nobody looks at you. Everybody's looking at the bride. Who cares about you? <laughs> He's right. I don't, I don't need a special experience other than a groom and a bride vowing their lives to one another under God before his witnesses. And, biblically, it's not here comes a bride, it's here comes the groom. And if you don't think Satan's alive and well by undermining the very definition of marriage, remember, it's a symbol of Christ and his church. It's a symbol of a father and his family. The relationship that we have, and to do anything that would distract from that, I want to say, no, let's honor this gift of God. So, back to big fathers mothers it's in the context of marriage even that's gone away you know I think I told you this I went, I went to a wedding I almost wanted to stand up and shout because it was so much a mockery of the wedding service I, I don't go to as many weddings as I do and um but I'll never forget it because the very last thing stated by the the officiant was I now pronounce you off the market I just wanted to stand up and shout, no, this, this is a beautiful symbol. And fathers are getting the short end of the stick in our society today in terms of their responsibility and their value and what it means to be a good, good father like our heavenly father. So I'll specifically say to you men, don't ever abandon your post because we have a perfect heavenly father who loves us, who gives us a responsibility that we're to honor and regard in our households and in the body of Christ, amen? amen. And women to support them in that as wives through a marriage ceremony and to give birth to children and to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That's God's plan. You know, even... <laughs> After however many decades of ministry I've been in preaching, to even have to say that now, to know that that's under attack. Can you feel it? Can you see it? Well, if you can, then we're to one, the ones who stand up. And yes, 
There are many imperfect fathers. That doesn't take, doesn't take away from the fact that God is our perfect father. He has given, as he's given his son, a holy relationship, loves us infinitely through his son Jesus. He gives us responsibilities that we might listen to him and honor him and regard him all the days of our lives. Wow, now that's a happy Father's Day. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. The relationship that the Son has with God the Father is to be an example for our own. In the Son, we have become heirs of the Father's kingdom, co-rulers with him, even judges of the angels. This high calling comes with a responsibility, as I said earlier. It's for just as a son glorified his father while on earth, so we too are called to glorify him. We cannot do this on our own, but only in and through the relationship that the father has entered into us through the son and the Holy Spirit. Are we sons and daughters of the father as we're called to be? Are we earthly fathers and children that reflect the father and son in heaven? Father's Day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that's the call of God on our lives because he's our Father. Let's pray. Lord, to call you Father, what a privilege to know that you're always there for us, that you're good, that you're perfect, that as you showed your son Jesus who perfectly obeyed you, God, we hear that very clearly, how much you love us, as you loved him. We can do nothing of ourselves, as he said he couldn't do anything of himself. That you would show greater works as we trust in you. That we'll all come under judgment by the Son of God. That we should honor you all the days of our lives. Lord, we can nod amen, but now the question comes, will we live that amen? where we live with those decisions to do what you've called us to do as Jesus did and as the Holy Spirit lives through us. I pray you'd give us the strength, the courage to honor you in all that we do. For every father here today, may they reflect you in their decisions, loving their wives, loving their children, loving you and families themselves. We would honor our earthly fathers and most of all honor you as our heavenly father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.